Hello and welcome to this video where we'll be looking at the group 7 elements, the halogens. So we'll just do a quick start off with some of the, the general properties which you need to know. It's kind of a recap of Chem 1. So similar with the, the group 2 metals. So boiling point atomic size, so atomic size fairly straightforward as you go down the group then you've got an increased amount of electron shells so the size gets bigger, fairly straightforward. Boiling point, this is linking back into your van der Waals, so yes there is a covalent bond between sort of say fluorine to fluorine but it is the intermolecular forces what we are interested in. So the forces actually existing between there. So with that we are looking at van der Waals. Now what affects van der Waals? It's the amount of electrons, since remember they're moving randomly all over, so you get some temporary instantaneous dipoles. So the way to answer that question is, sort of down the group, then you get an increased amount of electrons, or an increased MR. Therefore your van der Waals will be increasing, and always just try to get in when you're actually explaining that. It's the van der Waals between molecules. If you're talking about intermolecular force, you need that in. Otherwise, you'll drop a mark. Right, next bit we'll go on to, we'll look at the displacement reactions. So this is a series of reactions, what you've actually done, where you are testing the oxidizing power of the elements and the reducing power of the anions. So the anions there, negative charge. And you're actually looking for where a reaction took place. So I'm just going to put a line diagonally through there, because obviously we didn't test chlorine against the, the chloride ion, be no point. Right, so in your notes you should have a table a bit neater than this, but just gets it down nice and quick. So when we put chlorine in with the bromide ion, so that could have been sodium bromide as an example, or potassium bromide, just anything where we've got the bromide ions floating about, then we would have seen a reaction. Similar with the chlorine in with the iodide ions, the bromine in with the iodide ions, but we did not see any reaction with these. Iodine with iodide, no point. And the reason why it's to do with the, the actual oxidizing power and reducing power. If we look across here, chlorine, the bromide ions here have got electrons. The, chlora, the chlorine wants to take them. Now chlorine is a stronger oxidizing agent than the bromine element, hence it will take the electrons from the anion. Now an easy way to remember this table is to simply do this. There, so as we can see, the oxidizing power of the elements is higher at the top. So if we had the fluorine up here, that would top even the chlorine. We tend not to have it in this because when we're doing it in an aqueous solution, fluorine will actually just react with water and it starts screwing it up a bit. But obviously fluorine would be up there and would take the electrons from all three of these. Now, you need to actually be able to explain why this is happening. So why chlorine is better able to take electrons than, say, iodine. 
So it's linking in with your factors in terms of size, so atomic radius, shielding, things like that. So the chlorine, it's small, less shielding, so therefore it's able to exert a strong attraction to any incoming electrons. Whereas iodine, big, fleshy, weak, lots of shielding, further away, so the nucleus isn't able to sort of reach out and grab the electron and pull it in. Now, as for the reducing power, it's more or less the flip of that. Cl minus, so the chloride ion, fairly small, not much shielding, so the nucleus is able to keep hold of that electron. It's got a strong attraction towards it, so it doesn't want to let go of that electron. Whereas the iodide ion, again, big, fleshy, weak, big distance, big atomic radius, lots of shielding, so the nucleus cannot keep a hold of that electron, hence it goes away easy and the ion will reduce whatever it reacts with. It forces it to take the electron. Now this is pure recall, so you do just have to remember it unfortunately. Age, in the group seven, you have to be able to test for the anion. So similar when you did the group two and you had to remember the test for the sulfate, you've just got to remember the test for what you would see if you had say the fluoride ion, the chloride ion, etc. So you've done this with the, the silver nitrate and then adding the ammonia. First the dilute, then the concentrated. So again, try and get sort of a, a little table done in your revision notes. So first off, what you want to, want to actually have in there is what you see when you add the silver nitrate. silver nitrate there, AgNO3. Now with the fluoride iron, you don't actually see anything. The reason why is silver fluoride is soluble, so it just dissolves straight away. Now silver chloride, when that forms, you get a white precipitate. Silver bromide, Cream precipitate, notice here PPT, perfectly acceptable for precipitate. And silver iodide, you get a yellow precipitate. Now once we've actually got that, again we can sort of test because if your eyes aren't brilliant or if the shades of these are a little bit close together, you can separate between the whites and the creams by adding some dilute ammonia first. So I'll dilute ammonia, NH3. Now there's no need to do it here with the silver fluoride because if you know there is a halogen in there and when you've added the silver nitrate, if you didn't see any precipitate, it must be the fluoride because it's the only one of the four which doesn't give you a precipitate. And obviously adding the NH3 now isn't going to make any difference to it. When you add the dilute ammonia to the, the white precipitate from the silver chloride, it dissolves. So, no precipitate now. When you add the dilute ammonia to the cream precipitate, no change. Or slightly dissolves, you'll usually get away with, but you will still have some precipitate there. And when you add it to the, the silver iodide, no change. So next you can add some concentrated ammonia. And this just sort of helps separate out the final two. 
cream and yellow fairly easy to distinguish between but c'est la vie so we don't need it here obviously if that's dissolved we don't need it there now it will just stay dissolved if you add concentrated ammonia to the the silver bromide the precipitate will dissolve now but the silver iodide no change so it is the only one which is insoluble all the way through now they do tend to ask you to write the simplest ionic equation for this as well it is actually fairly easy okay there's the balanced molecular equation so what we've actually got the silver nitrate reacts with sodium chloride to give you silver chloride and sodium nitrate now if we break this up into the actual ions, so I'll just put the state symbols on as well. So aqueous, aqueous, solid, and aqueous. then you'll notice we've got things on both sides we can actually cancel the nitrate there and the sodium ion so what we are left with is just the silver ion reacts with the, the halogen ion to give you the actual precipitate which comes out or the soluble one with the, the silver fluoride but that would actually all cancel all of them follow this so if you had say the bromide or the iodide, just simply replace it there and you just get AGBR and AGI. Easy. When you're doing the tests as well, you will be asked why it needs to be acidified silver nitrate. It needs to be acidified because the, the silver will actually react with any hydroxide or carbonate or sulfate, sulfite, plenty of anions about. It will actually mess it up. So get sort of And you will get it precipitate now, which obviously screws up you trying to identify if you've got any precipitate from the, the silver halide. So with this, we need to add nitric acid, so HNO3. And it simply reacts in an acid-base reaction, removes the actual anions. Now, why we don't use hydrochloric acid? Obviously, we're testing for halogens. HCl has got chlorine in it so when we add that we'd have some chloride ions floating about screws up what you're looking for if we added sulfuric acid well it's got the sulfate ion in it that would react with the silver anion and give you a precipitate so nitric acid for this Now the reactions of the actual sodium halide with conch sulfuric acid. If you try to remember all of these off by heart, either A you have a photographic memory or B you are daft. Because you will not be able to remember them all off by heart. 
what you should try and do is actually just remember sort of one of the products and then just sort of do a, a redox equation around it. I'll show you how in a second. First one, what it's actually shown by the way is it's testing the reducing power. So thinking back to the displacement table, what you saw before, you should be able to have a rough guess of which will actually reduce the sulfuric acid the most now. So these two, the sodium fluoride, the sodium chloride, they do not actually reduce the sulfuric acid. Just on the chlorine one here, since it's the, the more common. So you'll notice if we actually did this in full as an ionic equation, all that's actually happening here is the sulfuric acid is behaving as a Bronsted acid. It is giving a hydrogen ion to the chloride. So the chloride is acting as a base. It is accepting a hydrogen ion. So this is actually just an acid-base reaction. Simple as that, if you did it ionically. Because if you work through this, you should be able to identify the oxidation numbers. You'll actually spot nothing changes. Um, one of the observations you'll make if this has taken place is when you form this HCl, as a gas it's colourless, but as soon as it hits any humidity in the atmosphere, it forms white steamy fumes. And obviously you can test for hydrochloric acid just by putting it in some uni well, universal indicator paper just hold it over the top so when the gas actually comes out and hits it well it detects an acid hitting it now the NABR Game. What I'm actually going to do here is not write the full equation for you. I'm going to tell you what one of the products are and then you can actually find out for yourself what the full equation would be. So the bromide ion is a fairly strong reducing agent. It reduces the sulfuric acid to sulfur dioxide. If we put the oxidation numbers up, sulfur here plus 6 sulfur here plus four so you'll notice it's gained two electrons the br minus has caused it to gain two so the br minus turned into br2 at the end but you can, should actually be able to work out the half equation looking at that and then you can do the half equation for and then be able to stick them together so the sodium you can actually just ignore because we're just basically looking at that. Um, spotting sulfur dioxide, brown fumes coming off, fairly easy to see. Now the sodium iodide, this is the strongest reducing agent. So you saw that before with the displacement reactions, big fleshy gives away electrons nice and easy. So this will actually reduce the sulfuric acid to quite a lot of different products. You can get the acid base reaction, you can also get the sulfur dioxide, but it can also take it further. It can reduce the sulfuric acid to sulfur and it can take it even further still. It can take it right the way down to hydrogen sulfide. So you will get all of them forming. So it just depends on what the question's asking you for which equation you need to write. So if I put the oxidation numbers up, 